In this lab, we'll be learning some concepts and practical skills for administering the Bruce Single Stage Submaximal Aerobic Capacity Test. After you finish with this lab, you'll be able to tell why this test is conducted. You'll be able to identify whatever equipment that you need to conduct the test, and you'll be able to demonstrate the proper techniques and procedures for performing the test as well as understanding how to calculate the data to make interpretation. The Bruce single state submaximal exercise test predicts VO2 max. Since we assume there's a linear positive relationship between heart rate, workload, and VO2, if we know two of the three variables, then we can predict the third. In this case, we know workload and heart rate. Thus, we can predict VO2 using the regression line made from the heart rate response to workload. We use this test to identify a maximal MET level for the patient in order to accurately prescribe activity and exercise. Well, the best determinant of VO2 max is a graded exercise test to exhaustion, time, patient health, cost, or other factors may not give us this opportunity. And so we can use a submaximal test. We just need to be aware that the accuracy is reduced, but it still gives us a starting point for prescribing aerobic activity for our clients. In order to conduct a Bruce single stage, you'll need a motorized treadmill that could start at one mile per hour with increments of 10th miles per hour, and that can increase grades from 10% to 14 or 16%. Most apparently healthy people will not need to go beyond 14%. Heart rate monitors are optional, and while often used in the clinical setting, we'll be learning to take exercise heart rates with the radial or brachial pulse. We'll do them manually. You will have learned this in the heart rate tutorial. You'll also need a rating of perceived exertion scale. The Borg 6 to 20 scale is commonly used, a blood pressure cuff, and a timer. You can use any kind of timer. The one on your phone works nicely, or you can use the time displayed on the treadmill. The following is an example of data collection sheet for the Bruce Single Stage Protocol. You'll note that we should always take a pre-exercise heart rate and blood pressure. While the initial intensity is quite low for apparently healthy individuals, you should still provide them with an opportunity to walk two to three minutes at a self-selected pace prior to beginning, especially if they're not used to walking on treadmills. After initial warm-up and after any questions your clients may have are answered, you're ready to begin. You can place the blood pressure cuff on at this time or while they are walking on stage one. I'm going to explain this briefly and later you'll see a demonstration. Have your clients hold on to the rails and bring the speed up to 1.7 miles per hour to a 10% grade. Once they're walking comfortably, ask them to let go of the rails. Holding the rails will tend to overestimate predicted VO2 max since it is reducing workload. Heart rate should be recorded about the last 15 seconds of every minute. On the third minute, you can start 10 seconds earlier to have time for blood pressure. Heart rate should always be measured first and always takes precedence over blood pressure. Let's say in this case we have heart rates of 86, 92, and 95 beats per minute. What do we do now? Well, in order to achieve steady state, we have to have no more than a five beat difference between the last two minutes of every stage. Are we in steady state now? Sure, there's only a four beat difference in this case. This brings up another point. What if we're not in steady state? What do we do? A couple things to talk about here. Our goal is to be in steady state between heart rates of 110 beats per minute and 70% heart rate reserve or 85% of age predicted heart rate max. A general rule a lot of scholars follow is no more than 150 beats per minute. That's our upper limit. If we're not in steady state, then we must extend the stage to a fourth minute, after which we would assess steady state between the third and fourth minutes of that stage. Blood pressure and RPE would not be collected at the third minute, but rather at the fourth minute. In our case, 
we must proceed to the next stage because, even though we are in steady state, heart rates are not high enough. Remember, they must be above 110 beats per minute. Why may they have to be above 110 beats per minute, you ask? Think about cardiac output. What are the two main components of cardiac output? Heart rate and stroke volume, right? In general, both heart rate and stroke volume contribute variably to cardiac output when heart rates are lower than 110. Once heart rates reach 110 beats per minute, their contribution to cardiac output is near maximal, and further increases in cardiac output are made mostly by increases in stroke volume. So now you will need to increase the speed to 2.5 miles per hour and 12% grade. You continue to collect data in the same way you did before, and let's say our client had a heart rate response of 104, 116, and 120 beats per minute. What do we do now? Well, there's only a 4-beat difference between the minutes 2 and 3 of this second stage, and they are above 110, so technically we're in steady state and the test can be terminated. But our client is still well below the upper heart rate limit, so we decide to continue to stage three with speed at 3.4 miles per hour and a grade at 14%. Our client responds with heart rates of 132, 136, and 141 beats per minute. What do we do now? Since we are in steady state between minutes two and three of this third stage, and heart rates are between the upper and lower limits, we're good to go. Now you may be asking, since heart rates are still below the upper limit, why not proceed to stage four? The standardized procedure states that if heart rates are 135 beats per minute or more at the end of the steady state stage, do not proceed to the next stage. So now, Note the last steady state heart rate and the stage in which it was achieved, in this case, 141 beats per minute of stage three. We need this information to calculate estimated VO2 max later on. Before leaving this slide, you may also be thinking about blood pressure. While this nor RPE is used to estimate VO2 max, blood pressure is taken to make sure there are no general indications for stopping an exercise test. For example, if systolic blood pressure drops 10 millimeters of mercury or more when the work rate increases, or if it goes above 250 millimeters of mercury at any point, and or if diastolic pressure rises above 115 millimeters of mercury, the test should be stopped immediately. Before we talk about calculating the results, I want you to be aware that if you have a client who is severely deconditioned or limited by their doctor beyond a specific MET level, the modified Bruce is an option for these individuals. You can see the only difference between this and the standard version is the grade for the first two stages. The speed still starts at 1.7 miles per hour. However, the grade is level for the first three minutes, and then for the second stage, it's 5%. Data collection for heart rate, blood pressure, and RPS, all still the same. Moving on now, let's talk about calculated predicted VO2 max from our example. There are many formulas to calculate VO2 from heart rate and workload, made by different scholars, different institutions, and you can see a couple in tables 15.4 and 10.3 here. We'll use table 10.3 as an example. What we need from this table is the estimated or submaximal VO2 since our client completed the stage three. The estimated VO2 at this stage for the equation we will be using is 31.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Here's a formula that was developed from Coase, Krause, and Jessup. To calculate estimated VO2 max, we need the maximal heart rate, submaximal heart rate, and submaximal VO2. Let's say our client is a male, 24 years old. While we traditionally use 220 minus age to estimate maximal heart rates, this has a standard deviation of about 12 beats per minute. 
And other formulas have been proposed, such as the Tanakh and Galish formulas. We're going to use 220 minus h since that is what this equation suggests we use. Here we go. First, we need submaximum VO2. If you remember from the previous slide, at stage 3, it was estimated to be at 31.5 mLs per kg per minute. Next, we need estimated maximal heart rate. And that was stated, uh, excuse me, you remember it was 220 minus age. That comes out to 196 beats per minute. Finally, we need submaximal heart rate, and that was the steady state heart rate at stage three, which was 141 beats per minute. Now simply solve the equation. Pause the video, break out your calculator, and once you've finished, resume the video. After solving the equation, I got 53.1 mLs per kg per minute. There's no need to go out more than the tenth decimal place for VO2. From this, now you can calculate maximal MET level and establish a base of fitness for an exercise prescription. So what do we do with this 53.1? Well, first we can classify how well they perform against other males their age. If we look in the ACSM's Guidelines for Testing and Prescription book, we see that this individual has an aerobic fitness that falls between the 85th and 90th percentile, which is categorized as excellent. This means only 10 to 15% perform better than he does. We can also estimate his maximal MET value since we know that one MET is equal to about 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Just simply divide his estimated VO2 max, 53.1, divided by 3.5, and that gives us about 15 mets. Now, let me take you through the test. 